Okay, welcome to our uh, D Challenge 2022 boot camp. Sorry, I'm just letting people in here. And um, today we have uh, Maria Beery as well uh, as James Heather talking to us about their two very interesting tools and resources available to those participating in the D Challenge 2022. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from them both. We're going to start off with uh, Maria Beery. She is um, going to be speaking to us about NPOD or the Network for Pancreatic Organ Donors with Diabetes Data Portals is something new and really exciting. So Maria, I'll let you take it away. Hi, um, thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as Monica said, my name is Maria. I work at the NPOD Core Lab. I'm a research facility specialist here. Um, also on the call is Dr. Mingder Yang. He's one of the directors at NPOD. Um, and I just want to say up front, I'm recovering from a cold, so apologies for the voice quality. And then if I, um, you know, I might have to cough or something during, but I'll, I'll try not to. Uh, so let's get no started. Um, okay, so um, for those of you unfamiliar with NPOD in general, I'm going to show a little bit of background information on NPOD um, once we get into the portal. We've got um, a few different tabs with more detailed information about our organization as a whole. But just to start off with, I'm going to review um, what our data portal is and what kind of information we have to share. So our new portal was created um, more as a hub. So we've got access to clinical and demographic information for all of our NPOD cases. We have um, histological images and um, you know, immunohistochemistry images, as well as electron microscopy images available for some cases. Uh, we've got a tissue quality assessment that's been done on our more recent cases within the past four years. We also have a functional assessment of the tissue quality and immunocore data also as available. We've got a few um, new things that have been added within the past couple of years. So as I navigate through the portal, you'll see that we don't have complete data sets for every single case. Um, most of this is due to timing and you know, as new technologies are available, we try to incorporate them as we can. So you'll notice that. Um, we also have a link to our sample ordering system. Um, for those of you who are involved in NPOD, you might be familiar with this system already. We use um, a data share, which is a separate site to showcase our um, shopping cart system for ordering. So this is where people can order slides, they can order vials of tissue, um, they can order cells, really anything that we have in our in our biobank. Um, and then we also are working on um, part of the portal that will be a place where our investigators can submit their own data sets. And then um, investigators can also explore the data sets of other people and download them. But these two categories are still in development, um, but they will be coming soon within the next year. And to review a little bit more about our future development, we're looking at um, submitting and sharing omics data sets from all of our investigators with the hopes that um, these data sets can be used you know, by the community um, and can be downloaded. And you know, we're going to have some um, interactive data analytics on the site itself. And then we're also going to link out to um, NPOD related publications. So. As people use these tools and you know, hopefully generate new publications from this data, um, we're relying on investigators to use the RRID um, identifier for each of our samples. Um, so that way, we'll be able to link back to any research that's been done and hopefully allow people to you know, integrate their you know, current study and then also look at previous studies of the same tissue sample from the same donors to hopefully combine all this information together um, so we can look donor by donor through different data sets and then also hopefully find, you know, where these similarities exist. All right, so our basic navigation through the portal, um, like I said before, we, we had a couple of uh, disparate sites for investigators to navigate. So what we've done is we've combined links for these sites, and then we're also organizing our um, our case demographics in a in a different way. 
So when you first reach the portal, there's a main, main hub page. Um, you'll see three different buttons that are currently active. So we've got one for explore cases, one for the inventory, and one for useful resources. Um, when you click on explore cases, it'll take you to um, a page that will display the case demographics and a few different windows to click through. One of those windows is a histopathology tab. Um, when you open this up, that will link out to two other sites, our Aperio eSlide Manager that has our IHC images and h &E, you know, Brightfield images for the most part, and then also an anatomy.org, which is where the um, electron microscopy images are stored. Can I, um, Maria, you... excuse me sure. for a second. How many um, uh, images are stored there? Do you know, just sort of maybe even a ballpark? Yeah, On ballpark, the slide, I want to um, yeah, we've got about 15,000 images on Aperio. Um, and then on anatomy.org, I want to say ballpark is roughly um, 50 or so images, um, simply because we've had a lot fewer cases that have been imaged um, by EM. But we are adding to that collection. Great, um, thank you. For Aperio, yeah, no problem. For Aperio, we routinely screen every NPOD donor that's accepted. So the pancreas is serial sectioned, and then we take um, blocks from each pancreas across the organ, as well as you know some of the accessory tissues we receive, and all of those are screened by H and E and through uh, three panels of IHC. So that's done for every case, um, and those are all available on Aperio. And then I'll get into I've got you know a, an actual site demo coming up too, so we'll look at all of that. Nice. Um, and then when we go to sample inventory, that links out to our data share site. As I was saying, this site used to house um, additional information, but it's no longer being housed there. It's, it's going to be archived. Um, so any of the donor information is now going to be viewable and available for download on that Explore Cases page. And um, data share is where our inventory is still going to be located. Um, and then we have this useful resources tab that I will show you more about. So let's go through to the live demo. Um, I'm going to start here. Okay, so this is our support page. Actually, I'll go back here. All right. So if you don't have a login, this is what you'll see at the very beginning. Um, you'll have the support and contact down here, and you'll have sign-in button up here. So when you get an account, let's see, you don't have one right there. And here's where you'll enter in a username of your choosing, your email address, password. We've got, you know, standard password requirements. Um, all this information here. If you are currently associated with NPOD and you know roughly your, your PI's um, project title, you can fill that in here. That really is just a quick way for us to you know, ascertain what kind of person or robot is attempting to access our system. So it's a, it's a quick way to just weed out people who might not, you know, might not be able to um, look at the information on our site. So if you have some information, that's helpful. Um, we do have a screening process, like I said, for any entries on this form. So it's not going to be an immediate approval because we do have somebody down the line who is screening everybody who signs up. But once you are approved, um, oh, I almost glossed over this part. We also have a user agreement. So this is a, a data use agreement. You do have to agree to it in order to access the site. Um, uh, and Maria, so so for, yeah. sorry, again, for, for the D challenge participants. So where it says, you know, um, uh, right where it says here, like your NPOD approved project, they could just put in D challenge 2022 participant. Yeah, okay. yeah, that'd be perfect. That would be an easy way to screen through everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, you just have to click agree to this user agreement. Um, sign up button will approve your account on the back end, um, and you'll get an automated email from us when you're able to log in. So then you'll use those credentials here. There is another verification step, so it will um, ask you to verify your email once you have an account. So it's going to be two automated emails, and then you'll be able to sign in. But it's pretty, you know, it's standard and, and pretty quick. 
So then once you are signed in, here's what you'll see. Um, these are the buttons I was talking about earlier. So those are currently active. Um, and like I mentioned, exploring data sets and submitting are coming soon and still in development. So they're grayed out. Um, I wanted to go through our support page real quick. So this is where you'll go, um, and you can see this even before you sign up. It's got more details about the sign-up process, um, you know, in case I've gone too quickly. It has some examples of the emails that you'll get just in case your um, email, you know, boots those to your spam folder. That's where you can um, see what they're supposed to look like. And then it tells you a little bit about the navigation throughout the portal. So I'm going to go over this in person, and we'll we'll view all of these features. But if you are you know confused or want to come back to this later, everything I'm going to talk about is is all located here on the support page um, in detail. And more information on our sample inventory. Okay, so that's that. All right, and then um, I'll do useful resources now too. So this is where you'll see more information on our operational model. Um, we've got details about how NPOD works as a whole, where we get our cases from, what kind of tissues we have, um, how we process the tissues into different kinds of samples. This is really good background information. Um, if you just go directly to our Aperio eSlide Manager, it, it might be a little bit overwhelming at first to look at the different you know, way things that uh, cases are labeled and um, samples are labeled. So this will be great for um, some background information just to get you oriented to what we have. Um, we've also got some videos on here about um, how to make sample requests. I know the people in the D challenge here are going to be working off of data sets. So I don't think this part really applies. but. For in the future, you know, if you do decide to join NPOD or if your PI wants to join NPOD, here's how you would go about ordering samples. Um, this is the RRID portal. So this is information to include in your publications when you're trying to identify an NPOD case. Um, we have an RRID assigned for each case, and that's what you would use in your publication. And then I want to make a note here. So our electron microscopy images, these are all shared by Dr. Ben Gitmans. Um, he has created a really great workshop. Um, the link is here. And his workshop goes through um, everything about electron microscopy, um, in particular, you know, with the focus on type 1 diabetes. So it's a, it's a way to get yourself acquainted with what you're actually seeing in those images. Um, so it identifies different cell structures and, and everything else. Um, so please check that out. And then down here, we have some other um, just helpful links and videos uh, and, and some of our previous webinars. Right. Okay, so to the site itself. Um, I'm going to skip over the sample inventory today unless I, you know, hear otherwise of, of people's interest in reviewing that. It is a separate site and requires a separate login. Um, currently, that's only available to approved NPOD investigators. We are working on um, making this portal, you know, more accessible to the public in general. Um, but that's something that's still in development. Um, so we're going to go to explore cases. And this is where all the data is housed that, that you're going to be interested in. Um, so what you see when you first get in, it's going to show all of our case IDs here on the right. Each one is its own separate button. And then on the left, you'll see uh, a, di a big set of filters. Um, so what you can do here, if you have a case ID of interest, you can type it here, and um, it'll filter just for that one case, or several. You can type a, a line of them. If you're looking for a certain data set, you can click here. And then this will filter the cases based on what data they have available. So I was mentioning that some of these, some of these are only available for uh, more recent cases. So we've got our functional assay. That's been done over the past you know, four years or so. So we've got 92 cases with that data. Um, EM, we've got 47 cases. 
uh, high resolution high resolution HLA. We've been doing this since the beginning, um, so that is the majority of the cases will have that information. We've got immunophenotyping that's um, just been in development this past year, so only 12 cases have this. But um, all four of these data sets are continually being added to. So, Maria, can you um, elaborate a little bit on immunophenotyping? We have a couple of people that are um, purely bioinformaticians. Sure. Um, I can show what we have. We'll just click into one of these cases. Um, and you'll see these tabs at the top. And we'll skip straight to immunophenotyping. So what we have available are the Tisney plots uh, for spleen here. And then we'll have PLN down here. So you can, you know, see this visually. You can look at the cell counts here, subdivided by cell type. Um, and then for the actual data, you'll go here to this download area. So this is where you can select um, a specific data set, or all is going to be our um, our case demographic data for the most part. So you'll go to phenotyping and download. And here's what you'll see. So it's divided by case ID. You'll see sample type. PLN is pancreatic lymph node, uh, spleen. And then we've got their flow panel, acquisition date. And then these are all cell counts. So everything you see here is a cell count. Um, so you can use this data to analyze you know, how you'd wish, dividing by percentages or different subclasses or, or whatever you'd like. Um, so that's what we currently have. Um, other filters that you can go through are by donor type. So if you're looking at just type 1, people with uh, no diabetes, people who don't have diabetes but are autoantibody positive, all of our other subtypes of donors are here. You can look at duration of diabetes, um, you know, if you're looking for older donors, younger donors, or with short duration, I should say. Um, we also have age of onset. Uh, age, sex, race, ethnicity, BMI, C peptide. Um, I want to point out here our autoantibody filters. Um, I'll turn these other ones off while we're looking at it. Okay. So this filter is going to look at specific autoantibodies. Um, right now, this is going to show 15 cases that are positive for all four of these. Um, as you uncheck, it's also going to look at people who are, you know, different combinations, but are positive for this in particular. So we'll look at this donor. They're actually quadruple positive, but since we have ZNT8 selected, it's going to show any case that has ZNT8 positivity. And then here we're looking at autoantibody positivity just by number. So this could be any you know, any combination of those four autoantibodies, but um, by number of, of positivity. So this one could be single GAD, it could be single, um, you know, anti-insulin, either way. I wanted to point that out because those are two different ways to filter. And then insulitis here is simply a positive or negative. So if you look at donors positive for insulitis, this is identified by our histopathologist who reviews all of our aperio images, and she will make a notation when she sees insulitis in the blocks that are screened. So that's a quick way to filter down for those donors. Maria, um, we just hand. have a quick question. Yeah, in the group. Yeah. Chatty. Go ahead. Okay, and Maria, I, I have a question on the donor type. Uh, sure. When you said uh, the antibody is positive, mm -hmm. so whether they are going to develop diabetes if the data is going to be updated or it's like they never develop diabetes and they're just positive. Um, I had a little bit of a difficult time understanding the question, but I think you're asking if it's going to be updated over yeah, time. Yeah, it's over time when they're going to develop diabetes or they are just uh, the data when you acquire and they were positive at that time. Okay, I'm still having a little bit of a I hard think, time. Well, I, don't I, know. Think she means... try. I guess that, uh, so these cases are all organ donors? 
So once they are diagnosed, they are diagnosed. Um, but once we get new cases, we will update them here. Does that answer your question or not? No, I'm saying for the same individual, like if you say antibody positive individual 602, when you diagnose it, it was uh, antibody positive uh, and it was an age like five year old, but at 10 year it got diabetes. So is, is it going to be uh, like updated or it's just mm. the samples yeah. when you I okay. I understand your question now. So all of our donors here, they're all organ donors. Um, so what we have is the pancreas, you know, after the person's death. Oh, and oh, instead oh. of going to transplant, if it's available for research, you know, based on what the family um, consents to, then we can receive that organ. So where there's not going to be any uh, changes to diagnoses later on. Yeah, it's all tissue okay. um, from people who have donated their organs. <clears throat> I mean, I guess that would be great to have sort of a blood repository where you could track um, people through the prodrome and look at that and or some other type of uh, organ uh, donation or, you know, extraction or something like that or visual imagery that, that could track people along, but that, I don't think that exists yet. No, it does not. We actually talked with Teddy and tried to see if they would um, sign up their <laughs> participant with MPOT, and it was uh, met with resistance because obviously these are younger individuals that participate in the te Teddy trial. They do not want to bring up organ donation. Mm. Uh, but potentially, if we are made aware, uh, because assuming these patients have been tracked in Teddy and it's participant pass away that the PIs in Teddy aware of that particular individual, they can contact us. We would have um, not just the Teddy information, we would also have the, um, the organs and hopefully we can match up, uh, get a big, you know, broader and detailed picture of the, of this individual's type one diabetes. But at this point, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to do that yet. Yeah, it's a good idea, but you know, maybe in future. Thanks for that. Okay, um, I'll move forward then and just go over a couple of different cases that I had picked out. So we'll look at this one. All right, so uh, as I was saying earlier, we've got our case IDs, we've got our RRID, which is what you could include in publication, um, and then we've got our donor summary here. So this is all data that's taken from the terminal hospital chart, um, except for some of these other lab values that we um, get the data after the fact. So as you look through cases, you might see, um, you know, they might be missing the high-res HLA, or um, C peptide initially until we are able to send out those samples and get the data back from the labs. Um, but as you know, it's kind of a rolling, rolling collection, we get about on average, you know, one case every two weeks or so. Um, so it's continually being added to. Um, so you'll see lab results here. Um, clinical history, this is also from the terminal hospital chart. It's all uh, pulled from that. Um, we've got our case processing tissue quality. Um, some of these things are done at the time of um, organ processing. So we weigh the pancreas, um, we calculate the RIN value um, from RNA that we isolate in the lab. We do our cell viability based on um, the other accessory tissues we receive. And then this image viewer here, this shows you um, some of the staining that we do on uh, pancreas tissue slices. Um, this is a new initiative, and what we do is um, we'll take fresh tissue slices from the organ at the time of processing, so the the tissue is still you know living because it's been transported in organ preservation solution. Um, you see here the red stain that's for um, uh, desazone, so that stains uh, insulin and beta cells. Um, red, so you can visualize the eyelets here. 
And then these other stains here is showing acute viability where green is uh, live tissue and you'll see little pink cells here. Those are staining um, with red, so those are dead cells. And then blue is, is dappy. Um, white is zinc wind, so that's reflecting off the zinc granules in the beta cells. So those are also showing um, insulin positive islets. So you can see different, um, there's, there's the whole tissue slice. Um, okay, so that's available. We also have the functional assay data. So this is after we screen those tissue slices, we run them through um, a perfusion uh, system. So the slices are stimulated with high glucose, um, and they're also stimulated with uh, high KCL to promote insulin secretion. So we measure the secreted amount of insulin in those slices. Um, you'll see the peak values are here, and these are also the values that you'll get in the functional assay data set. Um, I'll show you where that is. And then histopathology, this is a brief summary of what our histopathologist has seen when reviewing our IHC slides um, from each case. I'll link out here. This is our Aperio system. You do need a separate login for this as well. Um, let me just go here on our NPOD site. And then you'll go to the four investigators tab, online pathology. And here's our password request form for that site. So it is it is separate. But you'll once you do have this login, which is available to everybody, you'll be able to go in here. And then you'll have one role. You won't have six like me. Um, and that'll link you directly to the images that we have for each case. So like I said, we've got H and E staining across the pancreas, spleen, duodenum, uh, lymph nodes. And then we've got our IHC images here. Um, and we've got insulin staining in red, we've got glucagon in blue, and then this slide is CD3. So CD3 cells, T cells are staining um, with brown. So you can see all the slides we have um, for this particular case. Immunophenotyping we already reviewed. Going back here, um, like I said, if you wanted the functional assay data, you can download that here, and that will give you those peak values. Um, one important thing to note, so when you click this download button, it's just going to download for whatever case you have showing at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you'll see it just downloaded that single case because that's what we have selected. So in order to download for everybody, make sure you have this this section here um, full for your search result. And then you'll get the entire set. Great. That, and then if we want to download all, this is gonna download all of that demographic information and the lab values that we saw on that Case Explorer um, card for each donor. So this is going to be the bulk of the demographic data for each each donor. And also the high resolution HLA is here, um, you know, formatted all together. And then if you wanted that separately, you can download just just the high res HLA data. And this one has um, the alleles separated by column. A little easier to work with. Okay, and one last one I wanted to show the electron microscopy images. So this one will only be available if we have images and like it says on the note, it's for limited cases only. And then I see a note about are the slides available. Um, yes, the slides are available for everybody to view um, and you can look at them in your web browser. Um, as far as downloading an image, you know, you can take screenshots of any of the images you see. Um, but if you need the whole slide to work with for image analysis, that is um, a, like a sample request. So you'd have to um, just email us 
and give us the image ID that you're looking for, and then we can send you the whole image file because those are saved on a, on a separate server that's not publicly available, but we can send those images to you, uh, usually by Dropbox, or if you're requesting a lot of images, then we'd do a hard drive or some other setup like that. Um, here's the EM images that you can see. And I believe that's all I had. I know we're running short on time, so I just wanted to put up our acknowledgments page here. And um, I think we're ready to hand over to James. It's a really great presentation, Maria. Thank you very much. Um, it's yeah, a wealth of information it. and, you know, uh, building by the day. So the way you're um, putting it together, especially with the data repository, that will be extremely useful to scientists in the future. Um, so, okay, great. Um, thanks again. And then I'd like to introduce James Heather. I'm gonna have him do a little introduction, backstory about himself and where he's, he's come from Mass General. And it's very interesting. His tool is called Stitcher and it's really for making and modifying TCR or T cell receptor sequences, which as everyone knows in type one diabetes are uh, front and center in the etiology of the disease. Uh, thanks for joining us, Jamie. Oh, thank you, Monica. Uh, that, that's right. So I should give the obligatory, uh, I'm not a diabetes researcher disclaimer, just an immunologist, but as, as Monica says, there, there is a lot of overlap between uh, T cell receptor research and, and diabetes research. Um, so hopefully Stitcher may be of use to those of you who wish to employ TCRs in your diabetes research. So just by quick way of background to explain a little bit about TCRs for those that might be um, less familiar. Effectively, these are the receptors through which uh, T cells mediate all of their adaptive immune functions. So each different T cell clone that leaves a thymus can have a different T cell receptor formed of an alpha chain and a beta chain picture up here in the top right. Uh, which primarily is responsible for um, recognition of peptides bound in the groove of MHG class one and two molecules. So here I'm just showing a class one. So this is probably the TCR from a CD8 T cell. And um, obviously there can be lots of different peptide MHG complexes deriving the peptides from all the different proteins that can make their way into a cell. So there needs to be lots of different T cell receptors. And the way that our bodies generate these is through this remarkable process of VDJ recombination, which is a somatic DNA recombination process that developing thymocytes go through when they become T cells. So I've just illustrated it here quickly with the human beta chain locus. Um, effectively, what we have is a panel of gene segments in the unrearranged DNA. Uh, so for beta chains, we have these green boxes represent V gene segments. And if we just zoom in on the section down here, you can see these dark blue rectangles, which are D genes, and the yellow ones are J genes, and these are constant regions in, in pale blue. And effectively, what happens is that a, a thymocyte, thymocyte that's rearranging its um, beta chain locus will kind of pick a, a V, a D, and a J gene, and the intervening DNA between them will get chopped out. Um, and then the edges of those rearranging gene segments will be imprecisely ligated together. Um, and because there are lots of different Vs, Ds, and Js to choose from, there's recombinatorial diversity. And because there's this non-templated deletion and addition of bases at these recombining edges, uh, there's a lot of a huge amount of uh, nucleotide diversity added. And then um, we end up with a much shorter locus, which looks something like this, which we can zoom in and see that there is a um, now a contiguous V, D, and J gene um, put together. And then this can be transcribed. A leader sequence can be spliced on. We can splice out all of the unused J genes and assemble a fully functioning constant region, which is responsible for transmitting the signal intracellularly. And we end up with a mature mRNA, which looks something like this. And uh, I just want to highlight that this section um, of the molecule that's formed at the very edges of this, this recombination, this is the hypervariable CDR3 section, which is, forms the, the loop of the final protein, which is going to form the primary contacts with the peptide. So that's the, the key determinant of antigen specificity. And the same thing's happening in the alpha chain, um, say so that there's no, there's no D gene, it's just V and J, and there's many more Js to choose from. So effectively, all ex a great deal of experiments, certainly all wet lab experiments, but also a large number of um, computational experiments um, require full lip TCR sequence uh, to be able to do things, um, running from, for expression purposes, the start of the leader to the end of the constant region. Um, bioinformatically, you may um, be doing anything structural, which is also going to need a large portion of these, these genes. However, for various methodological and practical reasons, at most, we tend to frequently only sequence 
um, the kind of CDR3 proximal DNA. So we tend to take just enough of the V gene to be able to guess at which one it is. And then we often prime off the, the constant region to be able to um, minimize the number of primers we use. Uh, but that's if we're working off our own data. If we're working off third party data, you know, if you're particularly, I guess, for, for this audience, if you're going off public databases, maybe VDJDP or some 10x data or something, you may be using um, what typically gets reported, which is just the name of the V and the J gene and the explicit edged barriers of the CDR3s, which is, you know, sequence information is lost at every turn. So often we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, we will acquire a full length coding sequence, maybe for expression or maybe for something structural, something bioinformatic as, as in this project. But what we have is a spreadsheet. So there's a huge amount of immunological research, which is kind of bottlenecked by trying to translate between these two pieces of information. So you can you can do this manually. So if you take the VJ CDR3 information that typically gets published or deposited in databases or output by third party sequencing um, vendors, uh, you can turn into full length sequences manually. So you can you know you can go into the appropriate databases and look up the gene segments and by hand figure out where the different things intersect, but it's having done it myself many a time, I can tell you it's a very painful process. It doesn't have many of the properties that we would like our research processes to have. You know, it's not repeatable, reproducible, and it doesn't scale very well, which is where uh, Stitcher comes in. So this aims basically to systematize or automate that process going from public, the commonly available TCR information to useful sequence. So the concept of how it works is fairly simple. So I'm just going to walk you through a few examples, um, illustrating the different kinds of input formats that Stitcher can take. So at its simplest, all it requires is one of those simplistic T cell descriptions, i.e. Uh, the name of a V gene, the name of a J gene, and a CDR3 sequence. And this is all in IMGT format. So they're, they're the people that currently de describe the IMGT, um, the TCR nomenclature. And so the CDR3 has to run inclusively from the conserved cysteine to the conserved phenylalanine. And then you can give the CDR3 in several different formats. Here I'm illustrating what is most common if you're using third party data, which is likely to be a, an amino acid sequence. So when you give Stitcher this information, the first thing it's going to do is take these genes, these identifiers, and look up the nucleotide germline sequence from the, the reference database it has, which is basically I've just scraped IMGT gene DB. And then um, it's going to take those nucleotide sequences and translate them, and then look for the longest possible portions of the CDR3 that could be encoded by these germline genes. So it's going to translate these nucleotide sequences and basically knock off residues incrementally until it finds, for example, the longest suffix of the um, the N terminal of the CDR3, which matches the longest sorry the longest prefix of the CDR3, which matches the longest suffix of the V gene, and do the vice versa in the J. And so in this case, you can see CASS could be encoded in the by this germline V gene. So it's going to take the nucleotide sequence of that gene up to the end of that codon and say all of this is going to be encoded by the V. It's going to do the same, same thing, the J. So in this case, it's going to get the EKLFF, getting rid of these, um, these three residues, leaving us with this, these black residues in the middle here. So these are the non-templated residues, which for, for beta chains and delta chains could contain some D gene derived sequences, but um, they're, they're so few and so hard to determine, we, we just put them all down as non templated. And then, as we've given it a sequence from amino acids that it has no sequence information to go off, so effectively it just codon optimizes that. It's got a species specific codon frequency table, and um, so it just is going to plop in the most commonly used codon for each of those residues to fill in that gap. Then it's going to splice on a leader sequence at the five prime, a constant region at the three prime, and output that full length coding nucleotide sequence. And I just want to show you that so this is um, by default a, a terminal script. So you can this is the command used to, to run that command. So we just say Python, which is the, the programming language, uh, stitches the name of the script, and then you just tell it with these flags the, the three pieces of information. And you might want to also supplement it with species or constant region choices, but that, that's uh, the simplest form that it can run in. So Jamie, are, are people sure. um, using Stitcher, are they coming, are they digging into the literature to find some of these sequences and then kind of running them through Stitcher or where are people getting their raw material in general? So it, it tends to fall in one of two brackets. So there, there tends to be people um, 
like myself who may be generating their own TCR sequencing data and wish to functionally validate it. So that's often they'll be doing some TCR seq where, like I say, you tend to not sequence the whole thing and they just want to fill it in so that they can synthesize a, an expression construct. But there's also a large portion of people that use it who are, uh, like you say, repurposing existing data, um, particularly people um, who wish to do, there's a lot of bioinformatic approaches and particularly kind of computational antigen prediction protocols which require structural information. Um, which so if you're trying to do some homology modeling of, of existing structures, you you might you, you're going to need to know the full immune acid sequence of your TCR, not just the the name of it, as it were. So that they're the two major camps. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so you can also provide that that CDR three as a nucleotide sequence. It's basically going to do the the same process, but it's first going to translate that nucleotide sequence, do that suffix prefix matching to try and determine like the maximum portion of the CDR3 that could be encoded by the, the germline genes. But then instead of using this codon optimization to fill in the gaps, it's just going to trim out the appropriate portion of the provided nucleotide sequence. Uh, it's worth noting, the so when you provide an amino acid sequence, it's, it's very rarely going to perfectly recapitulate the exact nucleotide sequence of the TCR as was rearranged in that T cell, because this is a, like I say, it's a codon optimization process. The nucleotide option, can do it, but it often might not, as as illustrated here. So um, this is this deletion process is occurring at a codon level, whereas VDJ recombination happens at the nucleotide level. So it can degrade a partial codon and then replace it with a redundant one. So we can see this this sequenced TCR used AGT to encode this second searing, but AGC is used in the germline. So that's what gets incorporated. So it, again, it's going to encode the same amino acids, but there may be applications where that is an issue. Uh, and again, just to point out, the CDR3 uh, field has just changed very simply from amino acids to nucleotides. So it's very, still a very simple command. However, so for those cases where you do need to perfectly recapitulate the nucleotide sequence, um, there is a facility to do that as long as you have some additional padding nucleotide sequences on either side of your CDR3, uh, which is what we call the seamless option. So that's achieved by adding this SL flag into your command. And here it does this suffix prefix, uh, prefix matching at the nucleotide level. So it's going to trim away nucleotide residues until it finds the longest possible match at both sides. And then it's going to chop in this entire sequence, which as long as you've got your V and your J gene and allele correct, it will perfectly reca recapitulate your entire nucleotide sequence. So I know that not everyone is super comfortable in the command line. So I've also generated a graphical user interface as well, um, which is also nice in that it shows off some of the tricks you can achieve with Stitcher. So for instance, you can add arbitrary sequences of the five prime or three prime, which is usually for kind of experimental validation, you might want to add primer sequences or restriction sites, but there are other um, potential per applications. Um, you can select on the left, the species and the, um, the chain you want to do. So you can do either alpha, beta or gamma, delta. Um, and you can populate that where available with, with example data, as you can see here. So it's filled in a couple of uh, an alpha chain and a beta chain rearrangement, which when we click run, you can see it's populated these output fields with full length coding nucleotide sequences. Uh, there are also some options over here on the left to link those chains together. Um, for example, via uh, a P2A sequence. So if you want to express uh, an alpha beta construct, you can very, you know, with a few clicks, make a biosystronic synthesis ready uh, sequence as which will be outputted down here. And again, I think for this audience, most likely I expect it's it's mostly going to be people that are working on humans, human data, or maybe mouse. Um, however, there there are facilities to run Stitcher for every species and locus combination for which IMGT has sufficient data. So I, I don't know if there's any camel models of diabetes, but if there were, you you could use Stitcher in that situation. Uh, so that's just how it works, just to kind of demonstrate that it works. I took a variety of different TCRs um, that had, had their crystal structure solved in complex with their target peptide MHC antigen. So these are ones for which we have very high confidence of their both their sequence and their structure and their specificity. And um, I've taken the uh, amino acids from the crystals, aligned them to figure out what VJCDR3 is they're using, fed that information to Stitcher, and then translated the stitched output and aligned it back with the crystal. And we can see if in each of these cases, we get um, very good alignment. This is just looking at the, the variable domain uh, with, with one major exception. 
there's one alpha chain from this mag ic3 tcr which does not align with the uh, the stitched with the crystallized version and then when i went and checked the paper for this this um, crystal it turns out that the authors had um, subjected this alpha chain to some site directed mutagenesis to increase affinity prior to crystallization so it's not using a, a natural b gene which again gives the opportunity to show off you know one of the, the benefits of stitches modular design in which effectively every part of the tcr that gets assembled is just a reference entry file um, so we can add any arbitrary sequence we like to it so this was the command that was used to produce the original tcr which which did not align um, we can then what i've done is figure out a nucleotide sequence that would encode this affinity matured tcr added that to there's a particular file in the stitcher directory which you, you can add extra genes to and i've just used this xg flag which stands for extra gene and it will now stitch with this different sequence which now aligns perfectly so you can imagine using this for any number of um, modified or non-natural tcr genes or even uh, you know there are a large number of tcr polymorphisms and alleles which are not covered in in the databases so if you have some patient specific data you can figure out what specific tcr polymorphisms they have and add them to have you know perfectly bespoke personalized tcrs being assembled uh, this, this flexibility can accommodate um, other kinds of, of common TCR engineering efforts, uh, one of which is constant domain switching, which we do to try and decrease the chances of introducing a TCR that's then going to mispair with an endogenous chain. Uh, so I've taken the, uh, the beta chain of a TCR called DMF5, and then I've basically told Stitcher to produce it with different constant regions, and then I've taken those stitch sequences, translated them, and then aligned them against a TCR which is naturally using that that constant region. So here it is, first stitching it with the human beef chain constant region it normally uses, and then comparing it against a, a natively uh, pet beta chain constant using TCR, which is in fact this is its own crystal structure. So this aligns perfectly. I've then stitched it with a human alpha chain constant region and compared it against the alpha chain of that crystal. And again, the the constant region aligns perfectly. It's producing an in frame construct. There is there is a little mismatch here because the first residue the first nucleoside of the first codon of the constant and actually splices on from the end of the j gene so that will vary sometimes but then we can add on very easily you know the mouse beta constant region the human delta or gamma any any arbitrary sequence you like you can facilitate just by making sure there is a suitably um formatted uh constant region in a, in a, a particular file uh, so I also wanted to demonstrate that the sequence of stitch producers are indeed functional. So the, this was done, um, this validation was done in collaboration with a uh, biotech called Gigimmune, who synthesized some TCRs with us that uh, we generated from stitching. So it's the four TCRs that I, whose alignments I showed you earlier, plus another one that had high confidence data. And Jamie, can you repeat the name of that company? Sure, that's Gigimmune. Okay. G-I-G-A-M-U-N-E. And um, what we do is effectively express those TCRs in JERCAT T cell lines, which are CD8 positive and TCR negative, and then co culture those JERCATs with cancer cell lines, which either do or do not have the right HLA gene to, to restrict the, the peptides that those TCRs are known to bind. And then um, those cell lines are stained with CFSC, so they go green, so we can distinguish them from the JERCATs, and peptide pulsed with the appropriate peptide. And uh, then effectively the next day we look for the non-green cells, the jerk cells, and we measure activation by expression of CD69 and the loss of CD62 ligand. So we can see for each of the five TCRs um, cloned into the jerk cells, we only see any activation when the antigen presenting cells have the right HLA and uh, activation only occurs when they are pulsed with peptide in, in a dose dependent manner. So Stitcher is reproducing both this TCR sequence and specificity. It's fantastic, it's great. Yeah, that was a very nice result to find. Mm -hmm. It really is. Uh, particularly useful for this audience, I suspect, is the fact that there, there is a companion script to Stitcher called Thimble, which effectively allows you to run Stitcher sequentially across a large file of TCRs. Um, so you give it a tab separated spreadsheet effectively of where every row is a TCR and every column is a, a property of that TCR. So you, it can be either single chain or paired chain um, cleaner types. And then again, it's a very simple command. You just basically point the script to your file. And then this at the bottom here, I've just benchmarked this, the performance of this script on some large public databases. So Emerson is the large adaptive 
um, public data set and VDJDB is a, a very commonly used database of known engine specific TCRs. And you can see basically runtime is, is linear with the number of input TCRs. So you can do a million TCRs in under 10 minutes on, on a desktop computer. So it's very um, convenient to do even relatively large data sets. And then just to demonstrate that the TCRs that we are um, stitching together with Thimble are correct. I made use of another uh, neat TCR tool. This is called ImmuneSim from the Greif lab where effectively it does in silico VDJ recombination producing like a gold standard repertoire of known VJ, CDR3 and nucleotide sequence. So what I could do is take the TCR information from these simulated TCRs, run that through Stitcher via, via Thimble and then compare the nucleotide and amino acid sequence of those stitched TCRs versus the ones that were originally simulated. And that's uh, what I've quantified here on the right is a very stringent measure of how many, what percentage of those TCRs did Stitcher get 100% correct with, with no mismatches. And then that's for every um, kind of mode of CDR3 input, either giving it as a, an amino acid, as a nucleotide uh, or as nucleotides, but using the seamless option with different amounts of nucleotide padding, which is the, the number in brackets underneath. So if we just look at the gray bars first, we can see that in, across all of the options, it always gets 100% of the amino acids correct, as, as, as is to be expected. That's basically what, what it was built to do. Uh, if we look at the seamless options, now looking at the purple bars, we can see it was in this situation gets the nucleotide sequences perfectly correct, uh, as, as might be hoped. And then with the nucleotide option, it does get a few wrong, like in that example I showed earlier, where VDJ recombination degrades a partial codon and then replaces it with a, a redundant equivalent. However, like I mentioned, it very rarely gets the amino acids, it, gets, it very rarely gets the nucleotide sequences perfectly correct when you provide it with an amino acid based CDR3. So if we're just taking these um, two instances where it doesn't get all of the nucleotides perfectly correct and just double check where those mismatches are occurring, they're all occurring in this, this is effectively where the CDR3s are, which is again, to, to be expected. But it's basically behaving exactly as, as, as would be expected. So to, just to summarize, uh, you know, TCRs are hugely important for huge swathes of immunological research and um, their, their sequence is important. Therefore we need tools to, to get their sequences right. And Stitcher is built to translate between the commonly available VJ CDR3 um, identifiers that are deposited to useful full length sequences in a manner that is uh, fast, repeatable, reliable. You can do rational modifications and via its companion script, you can do so at scale. Uh, just to acknowledge the people with whom I did the work, um, I'd particularly like to mention uh, Marta, who was a, a great tech who did a lot of the validation, who's now a PhD student uh, in Madrid. Uh, Matt Spindler, who was the chap at Gigamune, who did the TCR synthesis and original validations, and then Mark and Aaron, the PIs with whom I started and published the project respectively. And then um, if you want more information, the, the manuscript describing this work came out uh, early this year in nucleic acids research. Uh, it's all freely available on GitHub here. And um, if you need to, you can contact me about it either via GitHub, via the paper or, or on Twitter. I have to take any questions. It's really just such a, a powerful tool that you guys have developed, Jamie. It's amazing. Um, oh, thank you. I, I, I just didn't know if you could just sort of walk somebody through. So if somebody was reading through some papers that or had access to data sets with um, a number of TCRs that were, you know, related to early onset, you know, under two years old type one diabetes, something like that you know, they could then, you know, kind of parse them through these tools, correct? And see, uh, and kind of be able to see similarities, differences, things like that. Potentially, yeah. So, I mean, you, you may be able to do some of that just with the VJCDR3 information as is deposited. So that's, mm -hmm. I mean, people assume that that's mostly what, what they want to work with. I think the bioinformatically, the, the benefit of using Stitcher would be if you want to look for sequence level similarities outside of the CDR3. Yes. Um, particularly if you want to do anything structural, you know, if you want to do map any, do any homology, uh, homology modeling or map it onto into a 3D space, um, particularly with the advent of, of, you know, things like AlphaFold, I think that, you know, one of the problems with 
doing structural work in TCRs is that so few TCRs have solved crystal structures out of all the different possibilities that there can be. So Stitcher can provide a, a way to generate those full length sequences, which you could then take into your, your subsequent analyses. Right. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And then um, is there anyone else who'd like to ask a question? Feel free. Uh, I don't see any hands, or you can drop something in the chat. Oh, like I say, if it's if, if something you want to get have a try with, you can always um, either ping me a message or open an issue on GitHub. Yes, that sounds great. We may just add you to our Slack channel too, so people could reach out there. Well, I think um, I'm on it already. Yeah, I think you are actually. Sorry. Um, okay, so that is um, that's the the end of our boot camp. There, um, you know, if something comes up and you want to ask. Feel free to do so. Thank you all for um, your time and participating and all the excellent work you're doing both in the TCR space and in the NPOD um, tissue repository space and the build of that uh, the data um, repo there as well. That's very important. So thank you all and uh, we'll see you again next week.